Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to see each of you here this morning. Raymond has made it to the choir loft, and so we are officially ready to start. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. We gather here today to celebrate God's faithfulness. The Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, has been faithful to this body of believers, Rama Baptist Church, for 193 years. And we are confident that because he has been faithful for almost two centuries, he will continue to be faithful until he returns or until he calls us home. Much has changed since Ramah first settled, for, since people first began to gather here on this land. But one thing that remains is Ramah's commitment to God's Word. We are a church built on the Word. And so this morning we will read God's Word, and we will pray God's Word, and we will sing God's Word, and we will preach God's Word. We are able to worship this morning because our God has invited us to worship Him. Hear now God's call to worship from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you shall walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. And jumping down to verse 20, when your son asks you in times to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies, and the statutes, and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you. Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers." And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God, as He has commanded us. We pause today to remember the Lord's faithfulness, so that if anyone should ask us, what is the meaning of this service? What is the meaning of this celebration? We can say, we were slaves to sin, but the Lord brought us out of sin with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He planted us in this community and in this church, and he's been faithful every step of the way. Would you lift your voices with us as we sing our hymn of adoration, Crown Him with Many Crowns? Join in, please.
into singing, you may be seated. We do adore and magnify our God. Now, normally at this time, I would offer a brief prayer of praise doing just that. But this morning, I want your help. And so if you'll take your order of worship, if you got one on the way in or on the screen, you're going to see a reading from Psalm 136. If you're looking at the bulletin, the part that is in bold is the part for you to say. If you're looking at the screen, it is in yellow. Would you join with me as we offer this prayer of praise to our God? Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. Jumping to verse 23, it is he who remembered us and our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever. And he rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Indeed, it is our God who has remembered us and our low estate. When we see God in His glory and His splendor and in His holiness, we are reminded of our sinfulness and we're reminded of our need for our Savior. Our hymn of confession helps us articulate that this morning, that even as we are sinners deserving judgment, our sin is nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. Would you join as we sing, It Is Well With My Soul. So Satan, the
Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul declares to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Now I want to make it clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are saved. If you hold to the message I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, that he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one who was born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. In this scripture, the apostle Paul declares, he makes clear to us that Christ died for our sin. That in itself should remind us of the substitutionary death that Christ paid upon the cross. He took our hell, he took our suffering, he took our shame, he took our sorrow, he took our separation, he took the very sentence of death for you and me. We like to say that that is when he paid the penalty for our sin. It also says, as Paul is addressing the church at Corinth during that day, in a time of confusion about the resurrection, it says Christ was raised. That is, he took the corruptness of sin with him and buried it in the grave, and it is now forgotten, taking care of not only the penalty of sin now, but the pollution of sin. But here's the key. He's raised again. And through that, you and I experience with our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord, the power that is ours in the person of the Holy Spirit of God, that when Jesus left this earth, ascended to heaven, he gave us the Comforter, the blessed Holy Spirit of God. And so just in a few verses, God saves us, he sanctifies us, he secures us, and here, dear friend, is a truth that I'm finding we all need to know, and we can know it for sure. Last week I had the opportunity to preach a message simply on the three certainties of the assurance of our salvation, and we trust the day that you are saved. The three certainties are this, the cross, which we sang about. It is the Holy Spirit of God who's in you, who witnesses you on a daily basis that you are His. And last, it is the blessed Word of God. Oh, it's such a blessing to have our salvation secure, and not in our works, but strictly in His work. Amen? Let's stand together and sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
seated, choir, you as well for now. I'm so grateful for the Lord's faithfulness to us in our salvation, in our life, in our health, directing and guiding everything about our lives. Um, the church family here at home knows the condition and what I went through this past week. And to go into a room for a doctor thinking you're going to have work done on your heart and for the guy to look at you and say, there's nothing to do. It's perfect. It's clean. So you ought to be excited. And I went like, no, I'm confused. God was faithful. You know, he stepped up, he walked out, and my nurse, she's a little bit on the uh, Pentecostal side. I'm telling you what happened. <laughs> it's Jesus. When you went to him and you told him that you were having a problem with your heart and, Lord, your will be done, he said, Holy Spirit, go fix it. He said, the Holy Spirit, you know, he's not physical, so he just go, and he took his brushes and cleaned any blockages that might have been in there and any little dampered places. And the doctor, the second doctor, goes in and says, it's perfect. Only God leaves things perfect. So God is good to us. Well, uh, the song, uh, the choir's about to sing now. Um, you know, I, I taught Bible for a long time. And have you ever been in a Bible conference where they dealt with prophecy? You know, I remember Ed Vallow when I was a kid. Ed, he'd put out those charts that would go from that wall to that wall, and he taught dispensationalism, and that's, good, and that's what the Bible says, and boy, he'd just going at it. And, and I remember in Christian Day School, they taught us, and we had to memorize the dispensations and be able to rattle them off and all the supporting evidences and all this stuff. Can I be honest with you? I looked at the book of Revelation and scratched my head. I mean, a third of the world dying at one time, and all of these things that are, it's talking about when Jesus opens those seals and his judgment hits, it was just more than my brain could comprehend. And so they said, well, you got to believe it whether you can see it or not. Well, well, this past, last couple of weeks, I've been asked more than one time, aren't you scared of the pandemic? Nope. It depends on who you listen to. And I know I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. I hope you are. And so I know I read the last chapter more than once. And I've gotten it through there. And I'm going like, okay, now it may, has the pandi pandemic not showed you that something like this can happen? Now, this is nothing compared to when Jesus opens those seals. And there's only one person worthy of opening that seal. And that's Jesus Christ. So this song is about that. Introducing the idea is who is worthy to open the seal is only one person. He is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, 
He's David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and then open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and a lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. Amen. Thank you, Ethan and choir, for taking us into the throne room of heaven. We're going to continue right there this morning. Would you take your copy of God's Word and turn to Revelation chapter 5? Revelation chapter 5. That song that Ethan and the choir sang, written by Andrew Peterson, asks a question. Is he worthy? And we're going to examine the same question this morning from God's Word, the book of Revelation, chapter 5. The Apostle John, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, he has seen all sorts of remarkable things in his earthly ministry. But now he's been given an even more extraordinary thing to see as he's been caught up in the Spirit one Lord's Day. He's seen the risen Christ in chapter 1. He's been given messages to deliver to seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. And in chapter 4, he begins in verse 1 with a heavenly vision. As you're turning to chapter 5, I'm going to, to read from chapter 4 to, to set up the text for us. John says in chapter 4, verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. Chapter 4 gives us the glorious appearance of the one who is seated on the throne, one who is clearly God Almighty. All of heaven worships the one seated on the throne. But for what happens next, we must turn to chapter 5. Have you found your place in God's Word? Whether in body or in spirit, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Revelation chapter 5, starting in verse 1. 
Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints." And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of God for the people of God. So thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you now humbled by your word. By your spirit, would you help us to better see your son this morning? Would you let each of us leave here today with greater devotion, greater affection for our Savior than when we came in? Would you refresh us, convict us, and comfort us this day? Would you be pleased to build your church by your word and by your spirit? We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son and in the power of your spirit. Amen and amen. You may be seated. John has been overwhelmed by the sights of the glory of the one seated on the throne. He's surrounded by four living creatures, four special angels who never cease saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And there's 24 elders representing, I believe, the saints of the ages. They also gather at the throne, and they fall down and worship to him who is seated on the throne. But now, John's attention shifts. We see here in verses 1 through 4, heaven's problem. John now notices a scroll on the palm of the right hand of the one who is seated on the throne. This scroll is absolutely full of information. It's written on the inside and on the back, but it's sealed with seven seals. You can open it only so far until you break the next seal, and so forth and so on. So the contents of this scroll are secure until the appropriate individual can open the scroll. Now we need to get an idea of what this scroll contains to be able to understand what is its significance so that we can better understand what happens next. Some would note the similarity between this scroll and uh, Roman legal documents of that day. And they would say, well, this obviously must be the title deed of the earth. And there are others who would say, well, it looks like a legal document, but I think it's more like a last will and testament. Others will say, well, no, it's the Lamb's book of life. I don't know, but I can tell you what I do know. I do know that the prophet Ezekiel saw a scroll written on the front and on the back just like this. 
and it was filled with words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And I know that the prophet Daniel saw a glimpse into the future. Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 and 9 say, I heard, but I did not understand. This is Daniel speaking. He said, O Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And God said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So building off of the prophets of old, what was shut up and sealed for Ezekiel is now ready to be opened. Daniel. And the, co the contents that Ezekiel saw, lamentation and mourning and woe, we see that beginning in chapter 6, that's exactly what happens. The end of all things is at hand. What is this world coming to? How will this all turn out? The future of all things. What happens next? Well, John says in verse 2, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. John sees a mighty angel, a, a strong angel. What can this strong angel not do? What is he proclaiming? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Not who is physically able, not who is willing. Many a dictator, many a political leader would gladly, willingly hold in their hand the future of all things. But the question is not who is willing, but who is worthy. Who is righteous enough to approach the throne and take this scroll from the hand of the one seated on it? What is the answer to the strong angel's question? Silence. Crickets. No one steps forward. No one says, here am I, Lord. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to take the scroll or to look into it. Try to wrap your mind around that. Think about the saints of the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, King David, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel themselves. None of them are worthy to open the scroll. What about the New Testament? Think about Peter and James and Jude and Paul Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, none of them are worthy to open the scroll. What about the saints down through church history, the church fathers? What about Augustine and Luther and Spurgeon, Andrew Fuller, Luther Rice, Billy Graham, Adrian Rogers? None of them are worthy to open the scroll. The strong angel that is proclaiming, that word for proclaiming is the same word for preaching. He's preaching throughout every corner of the earth, and what is his message? He's saying, there are none righteous, no, not one, and the wages of sin is death. No sin-stained soul can approach the throne of God in their own merit. No one is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seal. No one is able to bring history to completion. No one can bring the cosmos to its fulfillment. No one can fix the mess of this sinful, broken world. Look at verse 4. When this reality begins to settle in on John, he begins to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. John weeps and he weeps profusely. These aren't silent tears. These aren't brief tears. They continue for quite a while. The more that the search extends throughout the heavens and the earth and under the earth, the more that John realizes that no one has been found worthy, the more he weeps. Now you might find this response from the apostle that Jesus loved to be a bit strange. Why would John weep when he was closer perhaps than any other person who ever walked the earth with Jesus? John had heard Jesus teach if anybody ought to know how this is all going to turn out, John ought to know. But remember, John has been promised at the beginning of chapter 4 that he would see the things that must take place. And now it seems as if he won't see any of this after all. Besides that, it's been decades since John first started following Jesus. Now he's an old man, nearly 100 years old. All of his associates have died. All of the other apostles have died martyrs' deaths. And here's John, exiled on a pile of rock out in the middle of the ocean, left to die. 
He's discouraged. Some of you here today are discouraged. Things hadn't quite turned out the way that John thought they would. The gospel didn't seem to be changing the world the way that they thought it would. Sure, it spread rapidly in those decades immediately following Jesus' ascension. But now churches are weak and dying. Five of the seven churches that Jesus addressed in chapters 2 and 3 had serious problems. Even the church that John had pastored and that Timothy had later pastored, the church at Ephesus, it had left its first love. John is crying like so many saints before, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long, O Lord, will you just watch? Rescue me. Return, O Lord. How long? You understand John's tears because you've shed tears like that before yourself. Tears as you've stood by the hospital bed of a loved one, watching them waste away and you can do nothing for them. Tears as you've watched that casket being lowered into the earth. Tears as you've watched your world fall apart around you. Tears as you've watched children and grandchildren make bad decision after bad decision. These are the same tears of our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are crying out right now, How long, O Lord? John wonders, Is this the way it's going to end? Well, we've seen heaven's problem in verses 1 through 4. Now, starting in verse 5, we see heaven's provision. Verse 5, One of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered, he has overcome, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Stop crying, John. You've overlooked something, John. John has been so con consumed with this vision of heaven, with the grandeur of the throne, that he failed to see who else has been there the whole time. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. These are Old Testament titles pointing to the Messiah. He has conquered. He has overcome. Over and over, Jesus spoke in chapters 2 and 3 to the seven churches, and he said, to the one who overcomes, to the one who overcomes. How can a church conquer? How can a church overcome? By looking to the lion of the tribe of Judah. By looking to the root of David, because he, he has overcome. We overcome by trusting the one who has overcome, the one who has conquered. John looks to the throne. How he had missed it before, he doesn't know. But in verse 6 it tells us, He sees between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb. John is looking for the lion, but he sees the lamb. Now children, the Bible is using these, these animal names not to give us a literal image of what Jesus looks like, but to give us a biblical truth a way of understanding God's Word. So don't misunderstand Jesus to be a physical animal, like a lion at the zoo or a lamb at a farm. These are images to help us understand the biblical truth. When we think of a lion, we think of a mighty animal able to defeat almost anything by its sheer strength and power. John is looking for the one who has overcome. He's looking for the lion, but he turns... And he sees the lamb. And the Greek word for lamb is not the generic word for a lamb. No, it's, it's the word for a baby lamb, a pet lamb, a lamb who can't overcome anything in its own strength, in its own power. But this lamb has overcome. And it's standing even though it appears to have been slain. It has all the sure signs of death and defeat. It has been slain, but it is standing. How has this lamb overcome? How has our Savior defeated sin? By becoming sin for us. How has our Savior defeated death? By dying in our place. 
like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a precious lamb without spot or blemish, unstained by sin, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, He died in our place. He was slain. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But praise God, on the third day, the Lamb arose. John sees this Lamb. And it doesn't look like any ordinary lamb. It has seven eyes and seven horns. And again, this is not a, a literal a vision of a, a very ghastly looking animal. It, it's to help us understand the biblical truth. So the seven horns are representing, I believe, complete and full authority and power. The lamb is omnipotent, all powerful. The seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth, representing, I believe, the full and complete Spirit of God poured out on every believer at the moment of their conversion. The Lamb has all power, all knowledge, all might, and all strength. Notice here that with the reference to the Spirit of God, that we have a Trinitarian passage. God the Father is seated on the throne. God the Son is the worthy Lamb. And God the Holy Spirit are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Well, what happens next? The Lamb in verse 7, He went and He took the scroll from the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne. Human language fails to help unpack the significance of this. All others bow before the throne in worship, but not the Lamb. If you or I approach the throne and our own merit, we die on the spot. But the Lamb approaches the throne and He takes the scroll. The one seated on the throne is fully God. And the Lamb is fully God. Jesus Christ is truly divine, truly God. And we see here that the will of the Father and the will of the Son are perfectly aligned. Just as Jesus told us that they were in His Gospels. It's the Father's will that all judgment and authority in heaven and on earth be given to the Son. We hear that in the Great Commission. And it's the Son's will that He does everything that the Father has commanded Him. It's the Father's will that the Son take the scroll and bring all things to completion. He's putting all things under His feet. Well, what have we seen so far? We've seen in verses 1 through 4, heaven's problem. No one is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. We've seen in verses 5 through 7, heaven's provision. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. But now, in verses 8 through 14, we see heaven's praise. Everything has been building towards this moment. John's weeping has turned to silence, and his attention along with all of the attention of heaven is focused on the Lamb. I imagine that everything came to a screeching halt and everyone watches with bated breath as the Lamb approaches the throne. What happens in verse 8 when the Lamb takes the scroll? All heaven breaks loose and prays to the Lamb. In chapter 4, the four living creatures fall down and worship the throne, but now in chapter 5, they fall down and worship the Lamb, because the Lamb, too, is God. And they fall down, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You know, the Bible teaches that our prayers are sweet incense, a sweet smell to God. But we often act like our prayers are a stench to God. We think that God must be exhausted hearing us pray the same request again and again. But Revelation chapter 5 reminds us that God loves our prayers. Not only that, our prayers are not wasted. Those prayers that you prayed that you thought would never be answered. Prayers for the salvation of a loved one. Prayers for the advancement of the kingdom in hard places. Prayers for the church that you love so dearly. Those prayers have not been wasted. Not one of those prayers has been forgotten. They are sweet incense to God. God hears your prayers. And don't miss this. The Lamb is the answer to your prayers. 
The prayers are offered to the Lamb because He is the answer. As praises to the Lamb ripple across heaven, we see three songs, three victory shouts echoing across heaven. Let's look at them quickly. The four living creatures and the 24 elders sang a new song, verse 9, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Christ died in our place. He died a violent, bloody death, taking the punishment that you and I deserve. In any version of Christianity that, Christianity that attempts to clean up the blood is not true Christianity at all. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in its day, and there may I, and there may you, wash all our sins away. Is he worthy? He is worthy because he was slain in our place. And by his blood, he ransomed us for God. He ransomed us out of our bondage, out of our slavery to sin. We are not our own. We were bought at a price. And we belong to God. He ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation in verse 10, he says, You have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. There's far more packed into these words than I can unpack right now. But let me just say that these words are a continuation of Old Testament prophecies, Old Testament promises, beginning at Mount Sinai, and God is faithful and just to keep every one of these promises, even as we see right here in the throne room of heaven. Christ has made us a kingdom and he is our king. He has made us into priests, and we no longer need a priest interceding for us like the saints of the Old Testament did. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Now we can boldly approach the throne because of the work of Christ, and it is our privilege to serve him as priests. And however you believe that the end times are going to work out, the Bible is crystal clear that we will reign with Christ. Is he worthy? Oh, yes, he is. Verse 11, John looks and added to the voices of the four living creatures and the elders are now the voices of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. John doesn't want us to do the math here. He's emphasizing that this is an incalculable number. Saying with a loud voice, verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The angels add their voices to the symphony of heaven. Is he worthy? He is. Let their sevenfold praise settle on your hearts. He is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Look at those first four things. We can't give those to our Savior. We can't give him power or wealth or wisdom, or might. He has those simply because of who he is. But we can give him honor and glory and blessing. And it's not only our duty, but our joy to give these to our Savior. We can bless him because he is worthy. In chapter 4, the one seated on the throne is praised for his creation. But in chapter 5, the lamb is praised for his redemption. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. But the praise is not over. Verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. We know that right now not every creature praises the Lamb. Many people even right here in this very city are rebelling against a holy God. Creation itself groans under the weight of sin. But we do know, based on the authority of God's word, that one day all of creation will praise the Lamb. We know that one day, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Revelation chapter 5 is crystal clear that Jesus Christ is worthy. In every way imaginable, He is worthy. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, and my all. The question is no longer, is He worthy? The question is now, does your life reflect that He is worthy? Does your life demonstrate that you believe He is worthy? Not just with your words, but with your actions. For some of you, the answer is emphatically no. I'm not sure what brought you here today. I'm glad you're here. But you didn't come to worship Jesus Christ. Maybe you came because you had to. You had no other choice. A family member brought you. A loved one brought you. But as a sinner alienated from a holy God, the mourning and the lamentation and the woe that begins to unravel in chapter 6 is just the tip of the iceberg for every sinner who fails to repent of their sin. It's just the beginning of eternity separated from God. The emphatic testimony of God's word is that you are a sinner deserving death, but Christ died for you. Christ died in your place that you might live to righteousness. Today is the day of salvation. Would you repent and trust Christ, repent of your sins, trusting him for the forgiveness of your sins, knowing that you can't save yourself, but trusting that he can. Jesus stands ready, willing to save you. Some of you came today to see friends and to see loved ones, and that's wonderful. But I pray that you've seen the Savior. I pray that you see Christ in all of his glory. Does your life reflect that Christ is worthy? Do you spend time with Christ in his word and in prayer? Do you tell others about him? Do you gather with his people? Now, if you and I were to talk one-on-one, -on -one, you might tell me, Pastor, I love Jesus, but I don't need the church. I don't need to be a part of the church. I don't need to be a part of God's people. Pastor, you don't know how somebody hurt me at church a long time ago. I may not know your story, but Christ does. Christ loves you and he cares for you. But Christ died for the church. And it's Christ's will that each of us be a part of a local body of believers. So if you're here today, and health reasons aside, other reasons, but as a general rule, you are not gathering in person with a local body of believers. I would encourage you to do that. As lovingly as I know how, return to God and to his people. Now don't fix your eyes on the people, because the people are going to let you down. And don't fix your eyes on the pastor, because I will certainly let you down. But fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, because he will never let you down. He is worthy of your worship and your devotion and your gathering. And to the saints of Rhema, I pray that this glimpse of Jesus in Revelation chapter 5 is the encouragement to you that our Savior intended for it to be. Remember, he was writing to churches who were discouraged in chapters 2 and 3. And after this heavenly vision of chapters 4 and 5, the judgment and the woe began to be poured out in chapter 6 and following. But Christ gave this vision to John, to those believers in the first century, and to every believer since then, to encourage us that no matter what lies ahead, Christ is worthy. I don't know what you're facing in your life. I don't know what you're going to be facing next week, but Christ does, and Christ is worthy. May we live like we believe that. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord in prayer. God in heaven, we come to you now thanking you for this vision of the throne room, thanking you for this vision of heavenly worship and for this vision of the Lamb. Lord, each of us here need to be reminded daily that the Lamb is worthy. 
that no matter what we face, we can take courage because the Lamb is worthy. Lord, for those who are here today who don't know you, would you draw them to yourself? For those who have wandered far from the flock, would you bring them back to the chief shepherd? And Lord, for those who are seeking to walk with you day in and day out, would we be encouraged? And would you help us to be more faithful this day? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we sing our hymn of response, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy, I will be here at the front. I would be honored to pray with you, to talk with you. There's other pastors here who would love to talk with you. If you have questions about following Jesus, would you come? Let's sing. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. Come ye weary, heavy finger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. I will arise and go to Jesus. Thank you, and you may be seated. Uh, as our ushers come forward to take up the morning offering, I want to remind you that this is just our, our normal offering at this time. If you're a guest, don't feel obligated to put something in there. We're glad that you're here. You can uh, actually take one of those uh, green slips of paper in front of you. Uh, even, if, even if this is, you're not a visitor, this is home to you, but you don't normally come here, I would love for you to just write your name on that piece of paper just so that I can know who was here and, and to praise God for you coming today. But this is our regular offering because uh, Scott Cannon is going to speak to us in just a moment, and we'll do a love offering for his ministry at the end. So just place your regular tithes and offerings at this time. Tommy Harper, would you offer an offertory prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day in your house that you can look to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much for what he has done for each and every one of us who have chosen to ask him to save our lives, save our souls. Father. Now I would ask that you would take this tithes and offerings and use it to provide service.
asking in every detail of that, but this, this part of the service is the time of, of dedication. It's when we respond to God's Word. And one thing that I try to emphasize quite often is that this time is not merely uh, hoping someone comes forward trusting Christ. We want that. But every time God's Word is proclaimed, we all must respond to what God has spoken. Part of that we do uh, in giving back our tithes and offerings. Uh, but part of that is, is God sends out His people to do special things, and we're, we're to respond to that. Scott Cannon is someone who has responded to God's Word many times over, uh, and I'm sure that he would love to tell us about all of that. But what I've asked him this morning is to tell us about uh, God's most recent move, moving in his life and ministry. Many of you know Scott. He was raised in the church, has families here with us today. And so uh, I pray that you would listen attent attentively as Scott comes and shares with us. Well, thank you, Pastor Charles, for the opportunity to come back. And uh, I've not had many opportunities to come back and to, uh, to be before my home church uh, because of my own duties and serving the Lord faithfully over the last 35 years. But, you know, I'm grateful for you as a church for teaching me years ago and teaching Shannon so we can pass on to our children, and now our children are passing on to their children that he is worthy. He alone is worthy. And Shannon, I've tried to live our life in such a way that others would not just know that by what we say, but they would know that by what we do and how we live out our lives. And, you know, in just this coming week on Thursday, uh, I will celebrate my 39th spiritual birthday where I walked the aisle in the building next door and gave my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And just a little over a year later, gave my heart and life to full-time Christian service. And so I want to tell you that you have had a huge part because my desire was always to impact the world from where I was at. And God used you early in our lives to teach us, to show us, to encourage us, to challenge us in our faith that we would serve the Lord all the days of our life. And I don't know about you, but as I walked in, all of you are as just as young as I remember you. But God is good. And uh, as I get to celebrate and be home and celebrate uh, my spiritual birthday in Christ, and, and, you know, in 10 days from now, you know, Shannon and I, 31 years ago, we stood right here at this altar and we gave our lives to the Lord to... Uh, one another before you but before him and we've been able to be an example in ministry through the years because of what we learned and what you taught us as we uh, grew up here and uh, God has used us we have moved forward and served in the church in Georgia we've served in South Carolina Kentucky and now we're in Tennessee but yes, Pastor Charles, God is calling us to something incredibly new, and our impact is going to be, get to be uh, much larger than just within states. God's calling us to serve the Lord uh, across the globe, and uh, we're excited about that. We're going to be able to take the last 35 years of ministry and 31 years of marriage together and have an opportunity to, uh, to serve missionaries and every nation, every tribe, every people group around the world. And it all started in a small town in Palmetto, Georgia. So I want you to understand that God can use you. I'm from here. And God has moved me around the southeast. And it is encouraging to me to know that people that we've been able to share our Christ with are around the world. And as I stepped away in faith, Shannon and I stepped away back uh, earlier this year because we felt God was calling us to something different. All I've ever known is to serve the church full time. And I've done so for 35 years and God called us away, not knowing what was next. But he knew, right? We don't see the finished product, but he does. And when God challenges you and when God challenges me to step out and to live by faith, he's only asking us because he knows that he has something better. 
But we in the flesh, even a 35, uh, almost 38, 39 year old Christian now, I still have those moments where I go, really God? Are you sure? He's sure. And we stepped out not knowing what was next. And only three days later, a ministry organization that I had served on before and been on mission trips before. I'd taken my, my boys on a mission trips to the Dominican Republic for, uh, to use a, a simple baseball to share the gospel. A, a ministry where Shannon had had the opportunity to, to, to go and to, to be involved with a ministry called the Lily House who had one goal to take lady, ladies of the evening to help take ladies off the street and to reach them with the gospel and to encourage them, to teach them life skills, to teach them that they didn't have to sell their bodies. But there were many other things that they could do to take care and provide for themselves. And their greatest need was Jesus. And little do we know that God would call us to come alongside with this ministry. This ministry is entitled SCORE International. This, this ministry is based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, but they are worldwide and growing each day. They have one mission, is to glorify God through uh, obedience to the Great Commission. And can I tell you where I learned the Great Commission? I learned it right here. Uh, my father-in-law taught us as disciples, as we go through life, share and give evidence with our life, that, that exchange life, to share that with those that we come into contact with. And for me, that's been in Georgia and Tennessee and Kentucky and South Carolina and in other places that I would visit, but now an opportunity to serve and to come alongside with SCORE International. SCORE has a vision. It's a vision that, that I'm seeing more clearly now. It's, it's a vision that Shannon and I have been called to our whole life, but now we get a greater opportunity to have a larger impact in, in a larger area, and that's to give every man, every woman, every child where the ministry of SCORE serves them to give them an opportunity to respond to the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only gospel, the good news that I know of, through saturation of evangelism and true biblical discipleship. And our basis is the Great Commission. We, we must go. Every tribe, every nation, every people group will never hear the gospel if we stay. So God's called us to go. Now, for, for you, it may be as you go home. It may be as you go to work tomorrow. It may be as you go to school. It, it, it may be as you go to the mall or you go to the store, as you go to the field of recreation, as you go through life. God wants you to be a disciple, and he wants you to become a disciple. SCORE, S-C-O-R-E. The easiest way to remember what we're all about is we want to share Christ, our Redeemer, everywhere we go. I don't know of a greater job than that. Is to whatever, wherever, however, with whomever, to share the good news of Christ. Uh, we, we value four things. We, we value, in, in, in our core values, we want to evangelize the lost. We, we want to share the good news of the gospel with those that are desperately separated from God because of the sin in their life. And the truth is, all of us would fit into that. But somewhere along the line, someone shared the gospel with us, and we came to Christ. It's our job to turn and to share that good news. But if you've never received that good news, Pastor Charles has made it clear that you can here now, today. We, we want to engage people in missions. We want people to know that, that God has always had and will always have a mission to reach the lost and to make disciples until he comes back for his church. We have a desire to equip others to do that very thing. And we want to express the gospel in everything we do. People often ask, what, what is SCORE all about? Shannon and I knew SCORE from a very limited. I knew it had a baseball ministry, and we knew that it had a lily house, 
and we had friends that pastored and were missionaries there and we knew that they wanted to equip and empower the 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 missionaries and the pastors right there in that area but little did we know their scope was bigger uh, yes they wanted to do evangelism <clears throat> yes they wanted to be involved in discipleship but uh, score is is about church planning it, it has this anti-human trafficking uh, ministry that that is growing leaps and bounds not just in the dr now but in in other places even here in the united states uh, medical missions orphan care they have clean water initiatives uh, short-term mission trips they average taking seven thousand of you and i on mission trips every single year of course COVID has slowed that down quite a bit but they're ramping up trying to get geared for the end of 21 and 22 and 23 and in the years ahead but they have many short-term mission trips and they build trips to meet your need but not to do what you want to do but to build it according to what the needs of the missionary are and you can take teams through SCORE to help serve in these areas uh, around the world both domestic and international missions and sports missions child sponsorship there's children all around the world starting right here i would even say in our own community here in south fulton county they don't have parents and they need others to come along and so score has a ministry beginning to identify people in their ministry areas to identify these children that need sponsorship they have gap year is the old name it's called the climb program now they take students and some of you may be at that place in life or you may know a grandchild or have a child that your, your child is about to graduate high school my last child to tell you how young i am uh, we have four children for those of you that don't know us but our baby graduated high school um, this past uh, year and is starting a trade school for electrician and he kind of has an idea of the direction he wants but let me just tell you most kids don't really know what's next and so the gap year or climb as it is named now is an opportunity for a child to 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 go away and to be with uh, about a dozen of people just like them wanting to know what's next they don't really know if they want to go to college or not. They don't want to know if they want to go to trade school. They don't know if they just want to be a mom. They, they just don't know. So gap years, think about that gap. It gives them an opportunity to go off and they can move on campus in the Dominican Republic. They're there. They learn another language over these nine months. They, they are trained with curriculum to walk them through what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a missionary everywhere you go. During those nine months while they're there, in the design is that they'd meet with God for a nine-month period of time and be able to say, hey, God, what is it you want me to do? You know what? You take a kid and you take him out of his comfort zone, take him away from everything that he knows, and you place him in an environment where he needs to depend on God. That is the ministry of CLIMB and sports camps nationwide and internationally. Some of the places that, that we serve uh, SCORE International, maybe you've been to some of these places, maybe you have it. maybe you would like to, to go, I'd love to talk with you, I'd like to share with you more about what I know about some of these places, but I can definitely connect you with people who know more if God lays one of these areas on your heart. But we serve in Uruguay, Costa Rica, Panama, Dominican Republic, Haiti. And, and by the way, please continue to pray for Haiti. Um, I was able to talk with, with one of our missionaries who talked with a missionary that we have in Haiti. He is actually in the States right now, so he's safe, but he's very concerned for that area there in South Haiti that was hit yesterday by the earthquake. But Honduras, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and, and Brazil, and continuing to reach out to new areas uh, around the world some of the places that you don't have to get on a plane and go you can't you, you can fly to some of these areas but for those of you who say well i just don't like to fly well maybe you can get on a motorcycle get in a car get on a bus get in a church van you can go to some of these places but tennessee indiana south dakota alabama buffalo new york st louis missouri hey there are even some places here in georgia where uh, ministry is needed uh, right here by the way ohio brooklyn tampa harlan kentucky shannon had an opportunity to be in harlan earlier this year in illinois and once again 
ministry opportunities are continuing to grow because there's need all around us. But God's called Shannon and I. They, they asked me to do something specific. I've been on several mission trips through the years and have been a part of some SCORE international mission trips, but this organization has grown tremendously. started out in the mid-'80s. About the time I was graduating high school, this ministry was started in Chattanooga by a basketball coach from Tennessee Temple. But through the years, they've realized, much like the Southern Baptist Convention is realizing, that pastors and church leaders, they need someone to check on them. I don't know about you, Pastor Charles, but I would venture to say you were like me. I was always grateful when somebody called and said, Pastor, how are you? Because see, pastors and spiritual leaders in the church are so good at checking on everybody else, sometimes we forget to check on the leaders. And so SCORE came to the realization that, man, we've got missionaries that are serving out there and been serving for years, but no one has ever really checked on them to make sure they're okay. So that's what they asked me to do, to take our, our love and service and ministry through the years and for Shannon and I to be able to partner together and to do ministry together and to serve along with that. So they said, Scott, would you consider and pray about being our director of missionary care? I said, absolutely, I'll pray about it. And just a few weeks later, I called and committed. But we just, what Shannon and I get to do, we get to care for missionaries. We, we get to care for their families. In other words, I get to be a missionary to missionaries. And at the same time, I get to be involved in the missions in which we're already doing now. Already in our area, being able to be chaplain for one of the high school football teams. I didn't think I had that time when I was pastoring, and, and now I am, and already seeing some of those young men come to Christ and, and having baptisms at practice. And, and so the opportunities are all around us. You don't have to get on a plane and go to another country. They're right here in this area. But they want us to be able to minister to the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs of all our missionaries and SCORE staff. We have about 35 or 40 missionaries, but then you take all our other staff uh, domestically and internationally. There's about 100 people or 100 families that they want me to be able to track down where they are, what's going on in their lives, and to see how we can care for them, how we can shepherd them. I've been a shepherd for years. Now I just get to do it in a different way, and it's so encouraging, exciting to help develop and to build relationships. It's hard to care for people you don't know, right? And so we're living in a time where Shannon and I have a desire to get to them, to, to, to sit down with them. It's so hard with Zoom and, and WhatsApp and texting and Facebook and all. It's, it's good. I'm glad those are there, but there's nothing like face-to-face. That's like your pastor this morning encouraged, hey, return. It, it, it's, church is good, okay, it's good and okay online for a couple of weeks, but after that, it's like, I, I don't know about you, I just want to see people and hug people. I know you're not supposed to do that during COVID, but I'm going to hug people. Because if I hug somebody and get COVID, what's next, right? Uh, that, that's my testimony, but I, that's another sermon. I won't go there this morning. But they want us to come alongside and help mentor and disciple some of these young missionaries that we have. They want us to be a part of the whole vetting process of, of, of young people and people that are surrendering to the call of missions to be a part of what's going on in, in their lives early on to help them see, see and decide, is this what God's really calling? Not for us to be a judge, but for us just to be there and to be an encouragement, to be a support and to help them think about that. They want us to have some missionary, Shannon and I have got a desire to have some missionary enrichment events to, to plan to where we bring the missionaries to different locations, whether it's in Honduras or Costa Rica or Dominican or, or even ours here in our own country, to bring them into plan weekend events that we can just love on them, encourage them, to give them a little bit of fuel and revival in their own heart that they can go back out and continue to serve. In other words, just to to love on and to encourage those missionaries. And in all that, we get to be able to be a part of supporting the whole call and direction of SCORE. Man, what greater opportunity than to be a part of global evangelization? 
to be able to understand and to see people come to Christ. And once they come to Christ, to see them understand what the Holy Spirit can do in and through their life. And for them to become their own personal disciple of Jesus. And then been, begin to take what they learn and pass it on to others. So we have disciples making disciples. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to come back and to share. It, it, it's so hard. It, it would take me a week to tell you everything in, in just a nutshell of what all God has been able to do in us and through us. God has richly enriched and blessed us since our coming to Christ here and building our foundation. You were the first church I served. I was able to serve you for a number of years. You introduced me to so much. You, you, you introduced me, number one, uh, to, to challenge my parents to get back in church during that day. You, you challenged me in so many ways, and you built a foundation. And I've just tried to continue on through those years to build upon that foundation, the cornerstone of Jesus, and you were faithful to take care and to provide for my family during those days. As Shannon and I were a young couple, married, had our first two children here, and we left, and they were really young, and went to a, a, another church. You know, went moved from serving as a student pastor to student to education to education, uh, executive associate pastor, and then finally uh, finished at Pump Springs where I pastored for almost 13 years. So I've been able to be a part of so many different positions in the church. And, and the church is including you. We're faithful to take care and to provide for us. You provided for us weekly. You took care of our, our insurance. And we're forever grateful. But now God's calling us to something different. It's, it's a different side of ministry than I've ever been on. Because see, as a minister and a pastor... I have had the opportunity, literally, you take all the churches, uh, annual budgets that we've been a part of and the churches that I've served, you take Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong and you take every state offering that we'd ever take, any missionaries that we would always invite in to share. I literally have raised millions of dollars over the last 35 years, but I raised them for other people to do the kingdom work that God wanted to do through them. And so now God has Shannon and I on a completely different side. It's so weird trying to raise money for yourself. But you know what Shannon and I decided on? God called us to it. He'll walk us through it. Pastor Johnny Hunt, when we were at Woodstock, he, always say, he would always say, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And that God would always take... So early on, Shannon and I said, we're not going to beg people, and I'm not. You don't have to beg for God, do you? Let me tell you what, God is so faithful, he's taking care of us. Now, I'm a type A personality. I like to build my boxes and check off the to-do list. I, I want to get to 100% fully funded right now. But let me tell you, that's not what God's plan is for us. God is just taking care of us a week at a time. And it has been amazing and awesome to trust God and to see that happen. And so I just want to ask you, we're in the process of raising a support team. Number one, number one, it's not your money. Number one, I need you, my home church, our home church, we need you to pray for us. And I know you do. Because I still have contact here through, with many of you through social media. My mom and dad still live here. Uh, Shane's parents still live on the north side. So we're still in contact here. And we still communicate with, with some of these, the youth that were here. They're still youth in my mind. But we're all getting older. We just, would you pray that God would do his work through us, whatever that looks like? That is our, we need a prayer team to surround us because we're only going to be as effective if you and I are praying about what God wants us to do. But in that process, I've heard missionaries my entire ministry say this, but we also need your financial help. And I'm going to say this, and I'll leave it here. 
Because God is faithful. I recently have been reading a book, and, and God really challenged me and grew me. Because I felt like every email I sent, every text I sent, every phone call I sent, I felt like I was begging and mooching. And I don't like beggars and moochers. I never did, and I still don't. But I read a book, or I'm, I'm reading a book about to finish it, called The God Ask. And God clearly reminded me, Scott, you're not asking for you. Scott, you are asking people to ask God how they can be a part of what he is doing, God, through your life. So I just simply ask you that. Don't, don't give to me because I'm asking, because we need it. God knows our need before we even ask, right? But I would ask that you would just ask God. Say, God, how would you have me be a part of Scott and Shannon's ministry through SCORE? And would you just be obedient to what God says? Because God is amazing. Do you know there's people that I have asked that question to, and they have supported us. But there's some that I've asked that question that haven't. But let me tell you how awesome God is. The same Holy Spirit that lives in me, if you're a believer, He lives in you. I've got people that have given to us and I haven't even asked. Just because God laid us on their heart. And we're forever grateful. And that's how God's taking care of us a week or two at a time. And you know what? Shannon and I have come to an understanding. We think that's the way God is going to do for us. That's living by faith. And so we want to do that. And so I'm grateful, church. We've got some cards. I never thought I'd, Shannon and I would make a little card. I mean, we've had cards for years on our refrigerator where we'd walk by and we'd pray for missionaries. We, we actually had a frame one time where we just had missionaries in it from all over the world. And I was encouraged. We, I laid a few of these out on your table and I was fired up when I walked in there. You already got missionaries out there. Would you take one of these cards? There's our information. If you want to know more questions about what's going on, our, our email, our cell phone. If you want to be a part of our team financially, there's a donation link. There's also a piece of paper out there. If you just want some more information, I need some information from you. I, I need your name, your address, your email, cell phone, something that I can contact you with. That information is out there for you. I, I just want to thank you, Pastor, again for the opportunity. Church, Always believe that God can do something through you. And you're looking at me, many of you. I look out there and I see you. And many of you talked and spoke into our life. We are forever grateful. And I see people out there that not only spoke into my life, but I see people that I had the opportunity, that we had the opportunity to speak into their life. You know what encourages Shannon and I most in ministry? Is the people that we've been able to influence continue. They get married. They have kids. And they're still loving the Lord. They're still serving in the local church. And many of them have gone on and done things much better than Shannon and I ever could have. But it's exciting to watch that, to see that, and to know that. I haven't told you enough over the years because I've been busy doing ministry. But, Rama, I just want to say I love you. I'm grateful for you. I'm thankful that this is always home. I'm grateful to be here and just to think about and to ponder coming to Christ almost 39 years ago. Wow. What might God do in my life in the next year, five years? Maybe he'll give me 39 more years. I don't know, but I just want to be faithful in the time left to serve him. And I'd love for you to be a part of it and to keep up with you and let you keep up with us because it's not just what God's doing in us, it's what God wants to do through us. So Pastor Charles, thank you so much. Do you mind if I take a moment and pray for Rama? Or, or we were going to actually do that in just a few moments, weren't we? And, uh, but church, thank you again. Great to see you again. Thank you for the opportunity just to share a little bit. And uh, if you give me a call, I can share with you a whole lot more. All right. Thanks, Pastor Charles.
Thanks, Scott. Yes, y'all be sure to, uh, to pick up the cards. I've got one here in my pocket. Grab one from the table back there on your way out. We will be receiving a love offering on the way out the door, and so I want you to, to give generously to that. I know we look to, in the coming days as a church, uh, to seeing ways that we can support Scott and Shannon, but I wanted you to have that opportunity today. We do have uh, another special part of homecoming that we observe each year, and it's when we remember those saints of Ramah who have gone to be with the Lord in the last year. You'll see there in your order of worship seven names, seven souls, each precious in the sight of God and each precious in the eyes of Rhema. And we want to remember those dear saints today. Peggy Bay, Kenneth Bud Grubbs, Sarah Richardson, James Peake, Burt Coggin, George Bud Farr, and Lisa Helm. Even as time passes, we know that grief and sorrow do not quickly pass. So I want us to hear these words of comfort from God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13, says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's pray to the God of all comfort. Father, we come now thanking you for each of these seven dear saints who have entered your presence since our last homecoming. We thank you for the lives that they lived, the way that they loved their families, their church, and most of all you. As we reflect on their lives this morning, would you teach us to number our days? Let us live confidently, knowing that this life is not the end. Would you continue to bring comfort to each of these families listed? Would you comfort them with these words of Scripture and give us wisdom as a congregation to better minister to each family in the coming days? We ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I would like our, our ushers who helped earlier, if you will come forward, I need a few men to help uh, take these, these flowers uh, to the family members of those who are here. If you are a member of, uh, of the family or a friend or loved one uh, of these seven uh, dear saints of Rama that have passed away in the last year, if you don't mind, if you're able, if you'll stand at this time, and some of our men, we want to bring uh, just a small token of our remembrance uh, of these dear saints of Rama. They're going to bring those to you. And, uh, and we want you to know how much we love and appreciate those who have gone to be with the Lord in this last year. And we want to continue to uh, lift you up in prayer and comfort. Terry's going to come and, and lead us in a quick uh, verse as we sing, as, as y'all take those flowers to those. Thank you. When my life work is ended and I cross a swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Thank you for doing that. I know that, uh, that some of the family members uh, I talked to this week were not going to be able to be here for various reasons, but I pray that as a church, Rama, we would continue to lift up uh, these families as they continue to mourn the loss of their loved ones. Uh, continuing in the spirit of prayer, normally at this part of the service, we would join for a prayer of intercession, a, a pastoral prayer for the needs of the congregation. 
But because we have the joy of having former pastors and, and associates here this morning, I want them to offer the prayers for Rama. Now, we're almost done with the service, but I believe this is an important part. And so I will, I'm asking Daryl and Scott to come, and they're going to offer prayers for Rama for our congregation. And I want you to listen. Uh, don't, don't be looking at your watch. Listen to what they have to say. And if you agree with what they say when they're done, would you say amen? Would you men come and pray? Let us pray. Father, we love you. And Father, it is grateful and wonderful, Lord, to, to be back home. And God, my prayer is that, Lord, that you would continue to use this church to be what you want it to be. That it will continue to be that rhema. That it will continue to be that light on a hill, Lord, that can be seen all around. And Father, I thank you for the life changes that have taken place over the, the last 193 years, Lord, in the life of this church. And Lord, what do you want to do in the next year, in the, in the next years after that? God, that there would continue to be men, women, boys, and girls that would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That there would be men, women, boys, and girls that would give their life to serve you, whether they're an electrician, whether they're a plumber. God, where there's working at a bank, working at a school, where there being moms and dads, Lord, whether you call some to be missionaries and student pastors and pastors, God, whatever area, Lord, that they would go through life and serve you. Father, continue to do great and mighty things through this church. God, I continue to pray that you would guide Pastor Charles and, and Lord, his uh, leadership, Lord, and that, God, you would bless he and Lindsay and, and their family, God, that you would use them, God, to do incredible things for your kingdom here. God, give him that vision and give him clarity to be able to share that with his people. God, may Rama reach this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you so much for the honor and the privilege of being called to preach the gospel. I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit that you called me here to Rama Baptist Church. It was here, Lord, that you showed yourself strong through your love through your faithfulness and the servant hearts of these people. Lord, they had to be patient with me. They showed me gentleness, kindness, and peace. Rama has been a <clears throat> safe place for me and my family. This is home. And our hearts are filled with what you've done in and through us. And now to hear Scott stand and proclaim. To hear, Lord, and to see the faces of Jesus has been such a great blessing. Lord, as I find myself in latter years, I thank you for the opportunity again to be called and to serve. Bless this church even more and even greater than you have in the last 193 years. Lord, we love you, and thank you for loving us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you both for doing that. Uh, we, we did have others who were hoping to be with us this afternoon, but were unable to because of the change of plans. Uh, so we just have a couple of announcements before we go. I'm so thankful that you've come and been a part of what we're doing today. There's something that's not on the order of worship, but it's very important, and, and that's I'm supposed to take a picture. So if y'all want to just look this way and smile, just, just, just pretend that I'll be able to catch your face even if you're way in the back. Just look this way and smile. I'm actually going to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. Praise the Lord. Thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, I, <laughs> we're so thankful that you're here. Um, 
if, if, if I have not met you before, would you just grab me on the way out and say hello? I would love to be able to, to say hello to you this morning. I've tried to catch a lot of you on the way in. A few of you were dodging me and trying to get in the door, and I understand. That's all right. Um, I don't have a lot of announcements this week. You've been here long enough, but uh, I do want you to know, men, we are having our, our men's Bible study this Tuesday night. If you haven't heard about that or you're, uh, haven't, if you want more information about that, we have some on the table out there, and I would love to talk to you about that, but we'll have a men's Bible study this Tuesday night at 630 downstairs in the fellowship hall. Uh, everything else announcements will get to you as, as you need to know it. Uh, the one sad announcement that I hope most of you got to hear yesterday, but some of you didn't hear, is that we have chosen to, to cancel the meal and the afternoon uh, session uh, just simply because of, as we've talked to other churches who've had homecoming in the last few weeks, August is homecoming season apparently, and so others have, have already gone through this and they said, you know, it really may be a good idea to not have that meal with everybody gathered uh, down in the fellowship hall. Uh, and as hospitals are making adjustments, as, as cases are on the rise, we trust that this won't be long. Uh, but for today, it's probably wise for us to not gather downstairs. And so uh, you can stay as long as you want to talk in fellowship, but sadly we do not, uh, we're not going to have that fellowship meal downstairs. If you are banking on having lunch here, you have no other lunch plans. You need to talk to Don and Barbara Murdoch, okay? <laughs> now, I didn't promise you that you'll get food from them, but you need to talk to them about it, all right? So before we go, I'm going to offer us a benediction from God's Word. As God sends us out, as He sends Scott and Shannon to the work that they, He's called them to do, as He sends Daryl and Nancy to the work He's called them to, and as He sends each of us to do what He's called us to do this week, I want to offer us a benediction, a blessing from God's Word. And then I'm going to make a beeline for the back door as Terry leads us in the doxology. And uh, I look forward to greeting you afterwards. Thank you for coming today. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand.